What's going on, everybody, and welcome to another special edition of the Bombastic Podcast presented by Natty State Sports and hosted by yours truly, Andrew Ellis. Uh, for anyone watching on YouTube, if it looks like it's dark in here, it looks like I'm doing this late at night, it's probably because it's dark in here and I'm doing this late at night. Uh, it is currently 12.45 a.m. I am at Natty State Sports headquarters right now on a, well, I guess it's a Monday morning, Sunday night, technically. Uh, which, you know, with no context, doesn't make any sense. Why the hell would you show up at uh, 1 a.m. to record a podcast? I did not come here to record a podcast necessarily. I showed up because Arkansas hired John Calipari as its men's basketball coach, just like we all expected. And uh, when weird things happen, you know, duty calls. And so uh, John and Curtis did a great job of just going live as soon as, like, all this stuff was happening. And I was watching the live stream while I was at my house just doing normal Sunday night activities uh, the stream kept going. I was texting. I was like, Hey, should I like, you know, maybe should I pull up? But then I was like, Oh, they are probably not going to go too much longer. I'll just, you know, sit here. And I literally guys, I'm not kidding was in bed. And finally I saw Scotty pull up to the stream and I was like, dude, I gotta, I gotta pull up to the stream. Uh, I left in the middle of the night. My girlfriend was very confused. Uh, but I just was like, I gotta go, you know, we got to do our live stream. And so for anybody that missed that, on the Natty State Sports main YouTube channel, we had a full reaction to, yes, Kentucky coach John Calipari. Uh, uh, allegedly, reportedly at this point, I mean, I'm sure by this point that this goes out, it will be official. John Calipari is going to be the men's head basketball coach at Arkansas. Uh, so, you know, the, here we are. I was like, if I'm going to come to the office in the middle of the night and do a little live stream, I've got a, I've got a bombastic baseball podcast to record anyway. Let's just keep the vibes rolling. Let's crank it out. Uh, so I'm going to do that. We will get into all the Arkansas baseball stuff, which is what you guys came here to listen to and what I came here to talk about, my favorite thing to talk about. Um, we will get into Arkansas's fun and productive weekend at Baumwalker Stadium where they swept up Ole Miss. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but just before we get going, I did want to just kind of, you know, give my John Calipari take that nobody asked for. Uh, so it's it's a very weird situation here because, one, I'm not going to sit here and come on here and do a lot of things. I'm not going to come on here and, one, act like I knew this was coming – uh, I like like a lot of you kind of had been hearing rumblings like a uh, really about yesterday morning, yesterday being Sunday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. You start hearing these weird things of like, oh, yeah, there's like a Coach Cal rumor. Uh, and like a lot of you, I just kind of immediately brushed it off right away. And then it started circling like crazy. And everyone started using being like, oh, I'm hearing this rumor. I'm hearing this rumor. And John would be like, oh, I just got a text from uh, this guy at Kentucky. And he says he's hearing this rumor. Uh, I, none of us could really tell how legitimate it was. I mean, now that we've all heard the reasoning, it kind of makes sense a little bit. You know, he's friends with the Tysons. All that makes sense fine and dandy to me. Uh, but it was just hard for my brain, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, to imagine Arkansas coming together and making this happen, especially with just given how much of a little bit of a shit show it was this last week, Arkansas trying to hire a coach and having all these different deals go through and everyone's getting extensions. And so immediately we all kind of, or at least me, I, I kind of was like, oh, this doesn't feel legitimate. I just have a hard time seeing this really come to fruition. But this is the world we live in now. Just weird things happen. Uh, I think obviously there was a lot of you know weird stuff going on with Cal in Kentucky. He was not becoming increasingly, disgrunt, increasingly disgruntled there at Kentucky. Wasn't vibing with, I think there was a lot of pressure on him. Obviously, they've had some disappointing postseason finishes. Uh, so him looking for something else isn't super stunning just the timing of it and how it all played out is just really bizarre. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and lie and be like, hey, I, I've always loved Coach Cal, always knew this would be awesome, would be dying for him to be the coach of the Arkansas Razorbacks. It's really not even something I ever considered up until about 24 hours ago. Uh, and I'll be honest, I mean, if this were simply a move based on John Calipari, or Perry is what we've learned. It's John Calipari, not Calipari. We've been saying it weird. Uh, if it were just all based on his basketball on-court ability right now. It, you know, it's a tough sell considering how things have happened here at Kentucky for him lately. Feels like he's underachieved a little bit with a lot. But in terms of just making a splash, big name, and giving a good PR spin to this disaster of a coaching search, this is about as good as it could have possibly turned out. I mean, everyone was talking about Arkansas basketball yesterday, talking about Coach Calipari and just how this is going to affect the college basketball world and – you know, for all the reasons we've hated Kentucky all these years, Arkansas is going to have all of that. The media attention, the preseason rankings, the five-star recruits, like all of that you would assume is going to follow Calipari here to Arkansas. 
it's going to be must watch television. And look, just frankly, being in the business, I am. It's good for us, and so I'm not going to complain too much about it. Uh, I, I'll be honest with you; it wasn't something that like I was expecting to happen, and really not even something that like I was at the top of my list wanting to happen. But you know, it, when you're presented with an opportunity to shake up the scene in such a big way, especially just giving how it's played out for Arkansas this last week, I think it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, look, it's not my money. Also, that's also my stance on this whole thing. So we'll just see how it plays out. Um, but also, you know, when we get later, we'll start talking about the real scoops about what's going on here, which is Kentucky has a pretty good baseball team. So stay tuned for that. But, uh, now I guess it is time for us to move over and let's talk about some baseball. Uh, so Arkansas, like I said, had a nice productive fun weekend at home against the Ole Miss Rebels who at the beginning of this weekend, when this series kicked off, I remember thinking this was the battle for Chris Beard. This is right around the time. All the Chris Beard stuff was swirling with Arkansas. It seemed like that was going to be a done deal. Uh, then when game two happened, I remember just being like, oh, man, you know, Chris Beard pulled, pulled a fast one, and Arkansas is kind of, you know, they're going to have to win this baseball series because of how Ole Miss has made them look stupid in this basketball coaching search. But uh, now here we are. There's so much has happened this weekend. This seems like this was a lifetime ago. But uh, for those of you that do, do not remember, we're going to just take it game by game. Uh, this is not going to be the most structured, bombastic podcast of all time, but we're going to go through each game, talk about what happened, talk about what we remember from it, uh, read some stats, just all that fun stuff. Uh, but anyways, game one starts off like any other Arkansas game one, Hagan Smith on the mound. Uh, early on, it looked like everything was fine with Hagan. He gives up two runs. He had a little bit of a combination of bad luck on some batted balls and he, his command was kind of coming and going there at different points in the first few innings. Uh, it all culminates in the third inning. Ole Miss had three straight singles, one being a swinging bunt that kind of just an infield knock that was in a, in no man's land. Nobody could really get there to make the play. Uh, they had a legitimate single by Andrew Fisher just through the right side of the field. Uh, and then they had a bunt single to load the bases with one out. So just boom, boom, boom. They're in business. Uh, Hagen walks in a run. Then they have a deep sack fly, which like off the bat, I was like, oh, God. Um, deep sack fly, so that gives them a second run. And then Hagen settled in from there. And honestly, that was a huge moment there. So Arkansas falls behind 2-0 early, which, you know, Arkansas is the number one team in the country. Anytime they're trailing any game is kind of notable. A game with Hagen Smith on the mound, really notable. Uh, and Arkansas's offense was kind of getting shut down there by Riley Maddox for a while. Uh, Riley Maddox, Old Miss's starter, who is had been you know had not pit had been one of their top arms, only had made one start in SEC play, was getting kind of a spot start there in this Thursday game. Uh, he ended up going five innings, and through those five innings, held Arkansas completely scoreless. Uh, was getting a ton of early weak contact, a lot of like one zero ground outs, zero zero ground outs, one one ground outs. Uh, let me pull up the actual number of it. It was a ton. So he had five. He faced twenty one batters. And had 11 ground outs. So, I mean, like, it was just, you know, ball hitting in the dirt after ball hitting the dirt by Arkansas. A little bit of a frustrating start. Um, but then, you know, and then also you have Hagan Smith struggling. I believe he was at 80 pitches through four innings. So, at that point, you're like, all right, if we can maybe get one more inning out of him, that would be nice. Uh, you're down two to nothing at this point. I guess actually after four innings, Arkansas took they they scored their first run in the bottom of the fourth via J Jared Sprague lot with an RBI ground out there. Uh, but then yeah, after five innings, Arkansas it's you know down two one. Like I mentioned, Riley Maddox getting all this weak contact, and he had only thrown like fifty something pitches through five innings. It was crazy. Um, they decided to leave him in for the sixth inning. And it did not go as well. Stovall works the count, works like a nine-pitch walk. Uh, ben McLaughlin works a four-pitch walk. And then just like that, Vahiva Haloy hits a three-run home run to right field. A little bit of a wall scraper, but it was 107 off the bat. Just absolutely just missile opposite field to the right side. Uh, gives Arkansas their first lead of the weekend. They're up 4-2 in an instant just like that. Uh, Jared Spraglott followed with a one-out home run a little bit later to left field. And that concluded the scoring for the evening. Arkansas just had their four-run sixth inning, made it work. Uh, Arkansas also, for the game, out hit Ole Miss 7-5. to five, So it wasn't like they did nothing for all game and everything. But uh, just really weren't able to get anything going until that fifth in or that sixth inning when they really made it made them pay. Uh, Hagan, I thought, you know, gave Arkansas a lot of momentum in those middle innings. And DVH talked about it after the game. 
So I mentioned he had 80 pitches after four innings. He comes back in the fifth and gets retires Ole Miss in like 11, 12 pitches. Just boom, 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 real quick. So they bring him back out for the sixth inning. He ends up throwing 105 pitches. Uh, but getting those last two innings and getting his strikeout total up to 11 uh, and getting being able to get through six innings and give Arkansas another quality start because early on you could tell it wasn't like a peak Hagen Smith like going to be an electric dominant easy afternoon. Obviously, he's still Hagen Smith, so the stuff's always good. So he's always tough to deal with. But it didn't seem like Arkansas was going to get like peak Hagen Smith. So to get six innings, only the two runs and eleven strikeouts, pretty impressive given the circumstances. And DVH talked about it how. Uh, him getting through those last two innings really kind of fired the dugout up a little bit. I'm not saying that's why they scored those four runs in the bottom of the six, but uh, by the time Arkansas was able to land that knockout blow, which was the Vahiva, Vahiva Aloy home run, uh, Hagen had really swung the momentum back in the Arkansas dugout's favor. Uh, should mention Will McIntyre comes in and goes two and two thirds after Hagen does a great job and uh, one out left to go. Of course, Arkansas goes left on left. They go to Stone Hewlett, who vultures another save. He's now had saves in back-to-back weekends, throws just six pitches, but strikes out uh, the one batter he faced. Stone Hewlett has now thrown six and a third innings this year. That is 19 total outs, 15 of which have been strikeouts. Uh, pretty unreal stuff there. Um, but Arkansas gets the win 5-2 to two in game one. Honestly, it was a pretty like ho-hum just straightforward I felt like Arkansas was the better team they had more hits they had the bigger hits in the game uh, played really good defense had the better starting pitcher on the mound you know bullpen projected the lead I I thought it was just like a pretty straightforward well-played clean game like a classic Arkansas game one win Uh, set the tone nicely for the series come back in game two Arkansas got a pretty good outing from Mason Molina and when I say pretty good I mean pretty good it was just he was he was pretty he was fine you know, goes four and a third, three runs on three hits, did have the three walks, uh, struck out five. And early on, it looked like he was about to be just cruising, uh, but he gives up a home run to Andrew Fisher. I believe he gave a home run in the first inning uh, to Andrew Fisher, who's Ole Miss's leading hitter coming in. I think he had like nine or ten home runs going into the weekend, had two or three at least. Um, he was really kind of the one bat that was giving Arkansas a lot of trouble. Uh, so he had a home run on the top of the first inning. But then after that, Mason Molina had like four strikeouts through two. Seemed like he was going to like be on track for a pretty lengthy start there. Uh, but I should also mention, you know, Ole Miss took the lead at the top of the first. Arkansas responds with four runs in the bottom half against Liam Doyle, who honestly, I got to be honest, just got screwed by the strike zone a little bit. Ump was squeezing them real tough. So Peyton Stovall starts the, the bottom of the first off with a base hit. Uh, and then I believe it was like walk, 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 and then – Jared Sprayglot was finally able to come through with a nice RBI uh, two-run single up the middle. Kind of made them made it made them pay for all those walks. And then our boy Ryder Helfrich, uh, friend of the program, comes through just absolutely smoked a ball up the middle for an RBI ground out. Uh, I say that jokingly because he was like a little squibber that just happened to get the job done with runners at second and third and one out. Um, but you know, it's like Arkansas was able to get the momentum right back there in the bottom of the first inning against Liam Doyle, who's Ole Miss's most electric arm, I mentioned him on last week's program, Uh, a guy that I really wanted Arkansas to get out of the portal, left-handed, throws mid-90s, was touching around 94, 95 with his fastball consistently, Uh, was getting a little bit squeezed there, but Arkansas was working at-bats against him, really made him work. Um, And then Mason Molina, I mentioned he gave gave up the home run to Andrew Fisher in the first inning, gives up another home run to Andrew Fisher in the third inning, which made it 4-3 and immediately kind of, Makes you feel a little bit queasy about this whole thing because you could clearly see at that point, okay, we're not getting that awesome Mason Molina start. Like, is he going to, you know, is it going to be a battle? You're getting like Cody Frank started warming up in like the third inning. Uh, So it was like one of those games where you just felt like, you know, it wasn't really going to be a safe lead at all. Um, But then luckily, you know, not too much time goes by. Vahiva Aloy comes through with another RBI in the bottom of the fourth. Uh, Had a nice sack fly to give Arkansas, I guess at that point, it was a five to three lead. Um, and then, uh, once again, second game in a row, bottom of the sixth inning, uh, same inning and everything. Vahiva Loy gives the knockout blow for Arkansas. Uh, I don't know what the, I can't remember what the distance was. I think it was four thirteen, four fourteen, or whatever. But uh, it just absolutely gets all of one. Hits a two run home run to left center field, and uh, that was kind of the moment of the game. Arkansas. It seemed like anytime there was a big hit to be had this weekend. Arkansas was coming up with it. Uh, they hit a ton of home runs. I don't know what the final tally was for the weekend, 
but uh, each game had cool little home runs there. Um, and it felt like their home, they, they, they had all the biggest game changing swings, the big momentum swings. And I guess that's what gorilla ball is all about. Uh, in game two, really, I feel like the story to me was the bullpen was just lights out. So, uh, Cody Frank came in for Mason Molina with one out in the fifth inning and got, got, got the benefit of a really weird double play ball. Just got to call it what it is. Uh, <laughs> So Arkansas starts, I believe it was hit to Jared Sprague out there at third base. Arkansas throws, to, he throws it to second base and gets the guy at second. And then as Stovall is kind of switching his feet and going to throw, the guy slides into him, but the guy slid directly in the base path. 100%. Uh, Ole Miss challenged it because they thought that Stovall didn't step on the back at second, which was kind of weird. But when they challenged it, DVH was like, well, we're also going to challenge that it was, you know, runner's interference. Uh, I don't. I'm not gonna sit here and act like I really know what this rule is. I remember it's it's come up and flared here and with Arkansas a few times, most notably the 2018 College World Series Finals, where they benefited from that one as well. They somehow came back and said, "Yeah, it was runners interference, double play, both guys are out." So uh, Arkansas, who was bases loaded, one out when Cody Frank came into the game, doesn't give up a run there, which is pretty me- pretty meaningful. Uh, and then, you know, an inning later, Vivo Loy is able to deliver the kind of knockout blow. Uh, and the Arkansas bullpen goes on from there. Uh, Christian Fouch came in with, I believe it was two on and two out uh, in the sixth inning. Or maybe seventh inning. No, it was the sixth inning. It was because Cody Frank only threw one and a third. Uh, he did get his second win of the year. But, uh, yeah, two outs, two, two on, two out in the sixth inning. Christian Fouch, who had a really big, obviously, performance against LSU, which we touched on last week. He comes in, immediately gets a ground ball, comes back the next inning and uh, retires the side in order real quick. That's a lie. He worked around a one-out single. Um, but, you know, d- didn't strike anyone out. Three ground outs and a fly out. Uh, throwing that 97, 98-mile-an-hour fastball, mixing in that splitter, getting some swings and misses. Uh, once again, another really encouraging performance from Christian Fouch. But perhaps the story of this game, at least when you think about from a big-picture development for Arkansas, Gage Wood came in and it was not a save situation. He came in by the time he came into the game, I guess it was eight to three. Uh, but he goes two innings, retires all but one hitter he faced, issued a two out walk in the ninth inning, five strikeouts. He looked like the Gage Wood that was closing games for Arkansas last year, which when he was in Bomb Walker and he was so comfortable and talking his shit on the mound and strutting and staring dudes down and really had that bulldog mentality like we've all kind of known to love him for. Uh, he touched 96 with his fastball. I don't know if it was just like a misreading on the trackman or if it was just like a random rare back and whatever, because he's normally, his fastball's always been electric, but it's more like 92, 94 with a bunch of run on it. Him touching 96 was notable to me, but he was mostly 93, 94, but he was electric, as electric as he's been. Uh, I mentioned the five strikeouts in two innings, like do the math. That's pretty good swing and miss stuff there. He was getting, I mean, it was the curveball, mixing in sliders, the fastball, he was locating it really well. Uh, nobody really hit. I mean, nobody, nobody did much against the dude. Uh, it was a really encouraging outing, and he had that. Seemed like he had that swagger back. Uh, oddly enough, we talked to him post game in the press box or in the press conference, and uh, he was like, had a weird vibe where like he wasn't smiling. He was he was very like serious. And I even asked him like, hey, does it feel nice to kind of get back on track? And he's like, oh, it's just one game. You know, I got to attack the next one. He was very like, seemed like we're seeing the maturing of Gage Wood. Which, like, you know, cool. I mean, he's a sophomore, all that. Uh, but I still like to see that that personality and that dog come out on the field, which, of course, we got to see, which is really nice there. Um, a couple little notes from Game 2, by the way. Jared Spraglot, uh, who had the home run in Game 1 and had an RBI in Game 1, I believe he went 1 for 4, 2 RBI there, uh, also had two hits in this game, had the huge two-run single early, hit a double off the wall later in that inning. Uh, I've kind of openly voiced my support for Peyton Holt as like, I feel like he should be getting some opportunities at third base. We didn't get to see that, but I do feel like I just, I have to mention Jared Spraglot played pretty well this weekend. And, uh, you know, it seems like for now, like that's, that's his spot. It doesn't seem like it's really up for grabs. Uh, we'll see how that goes down the stretch and like what happens with Peyton Holt. Who knows? Uh, you know, I don't know what else to say about it at this point, but I just thought I should notice that uh, or note that Jared Spregla did have his two hits. But uh, moving on to game three, um, Arkansas wins this one seven to four. So Brady Tigert, 
all eyes were on him a little bit because his last few starts have not exactly been the most confidence inspiring starts. And they move, they they switch up the schedule, and you know you're kind of wondering like, oh, is anything weird going on? Uh, early on, at his first inning, four pitches <laughs> retires the side in order. Real quick work there. Uh, but then he started getting strikeouts. He had seven strikeouts in four and a third inning for the start, uh, but he didn't have any in that first inning. So he really racked some up in a big period of time there. He used a lot of strikeouts to get out of some jams. Uh, his curveball was like as electric as it always is. His fastball was solid. His fastball velocity was pretty solid in that 91, 93 range pretty consistently. Uh, had, did have the three, did have three walks. He gave up four hits, but a lot of those were softly hit. Uh, he didn't really get hit like for any like crushing blows or anything. Felt like he had runners on base in just about every inning, but uh, he was you know they weren't able to really land that knockout blow on him. And uh, one of the last you know at bats or batters he faced ended up popping one up, and it probably should have been caught. The wind was crazy that day at Bomb, and he wasn't able to make the play, and that allowed for one of those runs to score. So final line on Brady Tiger was four and a third, four hits, two runs, three walks, and seven strikeouts. But I felt like he pitched better than that line indicates. Uh, so I don't know if that start, you know, I haven't really seen the reaction online. I don't know if that start is going to satisfy you guys, Razorback Nation or whatever, but I thought for the most part, it, it looked like a Brady, like it looked like we're seeing the Brady Tiger we know and love. I thought last week, actually, he pitched better than his final line indicated. I think I remember saying the same thing about that because he gave up really just the two home runs to LSU. But uh, I think his stuff is is back to being pretty normal and pretty consistent. And, uh, you know, we'll see what the, how they tinker with his workload. Honestly, this game might be the situation a lot of times where Arkansas had so many options still available in Game 3 against Ole Miss to where there was no reason for them to stretch Brady Tiger out longer than they needed to. Who knows if that will always be the case, but I imagine there's going to be a lot of weekends where you have Faraday and Gackle and McIntyre and Colin Fisher and whoever – still available. I mean, they didn't use Cooper Dossett this weekend. He easily could have pitched. Hunter Dietz wasn't on the roster this weekend, which we can talk about a little bit if you guys want. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. They put Jason Jones back on and, uh, you know, used a lot of arms, uh, one of which being Car Parker Coyle, which was interesting to me. Um, but like, I, well, but my point is that they had options in the bullpen, so they didn't have to force Brady Tiger into like, hey, you got to give us six or anything like that. I think that could be the case a lot. And uh, before we get to the hitting aspect, I do just want to mention Jake Faraday is who they turned to to kind of calm the storm there for Brady Tigert. Uh, in his fifth inning of work, uh, he exited with, I believe it was like runners on first and second. Uh, Faraday gets a quick ground out and gets a strikeout. Stuff for Faraday has looked really good. He pitched really well on Tuesday night. I believe he struck out the side after walking the, the leadoff guy in that outing. Uh, stuff is electric as always. I mean, you see the vision there. I mean, he's just another guy like Fouch where – you know, if they, if you're asking him to go two, three innings, probably don't want to do that. But you just see if you come in and you have high leverage situations, especially against right-handed hitters, Arkansas has plenty of options. And then if you get Hunter Dietz rolling, if you have lefties that, you know, high leverage situations, you've already obviously got Stone Hewlett, who's like the freaking best left-on-left -left specialist of all time. You add Hunter Dietz into that mix. You've got some nice matchup dragons just kind of waiting in the wings in the bullpen. Uh, just such an underrated asset to have. So uh, it was really good to see Faraday get out there. I believe that was the first SEC appearance of his career. Uh, obviously, we saw him pitch in a very high leverage situation at the end of a game against uh, Oregon State earlier in the year. Obviously, we knew we've seen him like pitch a few a little bit more this year than we're used to. Um, but I just thought it was good to see him get out there against an SEC team and just kind of show the the staff like, hey, you've got another big time option to use in this bullpen with disgusting stuff. Um, Arkansas went to Parker Coyle who had a couple strikeouts and looked all right at times, but did give up two hits. And then they turned to Gabe Gackle who came in and it was one of Gabe's better outings. And uh, he ended up giving up a run. That was not actually one that he gave up once, once again, once he left the game, Will McIntyre gave up a two out single that uh, allowed one of his runners to score. But the final line on Gabe Gackle was two and two thirds, two hits, one run, one walk, and four strikeouts. Slider was disgusting. His fastball was touching 97, effortless. I mean, it's really fun watching that dude pitch. Uh, and I don't just say that because he is a bombastic podcast alum, the first ever, for those that remember, the real fans. 
Uh, but by the way, for, first career win for Gabe Gackle. So for anybody who like still puts a lot of stock in wins and losses for pitchers, uh, you can now officially declare Gabe Gackle good because he got his first college win out of the way. Um, but he did turn it over to Will McIntyre there in the ninth inning who came in, got a couple big outs there at the end. Uh, I tweeted out that I would trust Will McIntyre to perform open heart surgery on my firstborn child if it came down to it, just because whatever the situation is, I trust Will McIntyre. That's just how it's been for Arkansas this year. It doesn't matter if it's a closing situation. He's obviously started games in his career. He's done middle relief. He's done long relief. He's done setup work. I mean, he pretty much does it all for this pitching staff, and I trust him in any context in life, and that uh, that goes beyond the ball field. I would trust Will McIntyre with anything. Whatever the task is, I don't care. I trust him. Um, but obviously just another good pitching performance for Arkansas's bullpen. They end up giving up four runs on the game, uh, so four plus three plus two. I guess that is nine runs for the weekend. That's a solid three ERA. You'll take that every weekend and twice on Sundays, even though Arkansas didn't play on Sunday. But, uh, I mean, the story – I'm burying the lead here. The story of game three – was the Nolan Souza show. There was a point where Arkansas led, like I think it was six to three or something like that. I think it was definitely it was six to three when Nolan Souza hit a three run home run that gave Arkansas the lead late in the game. And at that point, Nolan Souza had five of Arkansas's six RBI. Uh dude is I mean, I was actually I went to the, the Saturday's game with my girl Hillary, and we were just kind of talking about whatever. And, you know, she follows the team from a very casual standpoint. She went to the University of Arkansas, cheers for the Hogs, but, you know, is not as uh, passionate as, as us weirdos are. But so she kind of keeps up for the most part, knows some of the names, and she obviously knows some of the people that have been on this podcast. So I was talking to her about Sousa. I was like, yeah, Sousa's kind of at that point where he's almost locked down an everyday spot. He's, he's almost in the lineup every day, most days. He's close to locking down an everyday spot. And that was as we were walking in to Saturday's game where he hit, well, goes three for five, has five runs driven in, scores two more. Uh, so he he also scored the first run of this game. Arkansas early in the game against Mason Nichols, who's, who's Ole Miss's starter, one of their veteran arms that they turned to to try to stave off a sweep. Uh, Arkansas loaded the bases, I believe, twice in the first three or four innings, but weren't able to really like break through and get that big hit or finally push across some runs. Nolan Souza in the bottom of the fourth inning finally gets a hold of one. The wind was actually blowing right to left a little bit, but he somehow hit both of these home runs directly into the wind. Did not scare him at all. Uh, but he got Arkansas on the board. And then later in the next inning, when Arkansas was able to, I guess, take the lead. Let me let me go back and refresh my memory just so I know I'm not going crazy here. So, yeah, Vahiva Aloy, Vahiva Aloy and Kendall Dick single to start the inning. Lowich was hit by a pitch, and then Jared Spraglock grounded into a double play, which technically gave Arkansas the lead, made it 3-2, to two, but it's like a double play with the bases loaded is just, just not the way you want to take the lead, not the way you want to, like, make that definitive statement. But uh, Nolan Souza comes in right behind him with two outs, smacks an RBI single, oppo right through the left side of the infield, just beats the shift, gives Arkansas that extra insurance run, which it turned out they didn't need because they ended up winning 7-4 to four because he hit a three-run home run later. But it's just another hit situation of him coming through, uh, coming through the hill when Arkansas needed it. I'll tell you what, man, Nolan Souza. I've got a few a big takeaways from this weekend, but really one of the big ones that sticks out to me is Nolan Souza. The tools have always been there. Like, you know, he's a very coveted recruit coming out of high school. Uh, from when he was first got on campus, you can see he's a big, strong kid. You see he's got the power, really good athlete. Like, this is a guy that could play center field. I don't know if he's going to end up playing outfield at Arkansas or if he's going to end up playing second, third, whatever. We'll, we can talk about that over the next three years as we figure it out, but – uh, this is that he's that type of athlete that he could play center field. Obviously, played shortstop in high school. I don't anticipate him playing shortstop at this level, but a really good, big, strong athlete. Uh, but the question is kind of like, all right, yeah, really good power, really good speed, but can he hit? Can he do all these little things? You're starting to see that approach really start to come together here because I remember like the power was always there. I mean, one of his first scrimmages, I remember him hitting a home run, but he definitely had to fight it a good bit, especially during the fall. Uh, DVH said that he noticed a difference in Nolan Souza when he when they returned leading up to spring right before the season started. Felt like he kind of locked in and mentally got over 
the hurdle of being a freshman and all that is at bat started being a little different. The le- the quality ABs have really stuck out to me because we've seen freshmen come in and have success right away, but you usually see like a little bit of an adjustment period where they're starting to make some plays, so then people start pitching them differently, and they're able they're not able to really adjust. It seems like Nolan is good at making these adjustments on the fly. And you just see him getting better and better and better. And he's making hard contact more consistently. We see him going opposite field. I mean, his first home run of the of his career was an opposite field home run. But we're seeing him hit balls on the ground through the infield. Uh, we're seeing him hit doubles in the left center gap. We're seeing him pull home runs out of the park. We're seeing him pull doubles down the right field line. Like He's putting together a full arsenal as a hitter. Uh, he's taking his walks as well. He's up there on the team in on-base percentage. Uh, his slugging percentage right now is 732, which is just ungodly. Like 500, I feel like is kind of the – if you're 500 and above, that's a good slugging percentage. Dude slugging 732, and I know it's not a huge sample size, 710 in SEC play. Uh, so he now leads the team with a 357 batting average. He's also second on the team with six home runs, which is crazy because he's not even – you know, he's he's just now getting to the point where he's playing every day. Uh, has the 18 runs driven in. Dude's been absolutely unreal. Drawn 10 walks as well. Uh, he'd been hit by a couple pitches. Like, he'll strike out here and there. He's got three stolen bases. Like, he's putting together a full arsenal of skill sets. It's hard not to be excited about that dude's future. He's got to be in the lineup at this point every day. I just feel like he, he brings too much of an it factor brings a ton of power, which this lineup kind of needs a little bit of. Uh, and I just think for the most part, he just brings a little bit of a dimension that, you know, sets this team apart, just gives them another little X factor there in the lineup. Uh, since we're in the lineup takeaways portion of the show, apparently, I'll just go ahead and say Will Edmondson at this point, I feel like needs to play every day. Uh, only got one start this weekend, which I thought was interesting uh, Ross Lowe, which, you know, got the start in the first two or first game and the last game of the series. I just think at this point, Will Edmondson has shown that whether he's starting in left field or center field, he probably needs to be in the lineup every day. But I'm glad that I mentioned that because I think there is some path to maybe one start per week. Because if you want to still play Ross Lovich, you could start Ross Lovich in left field and have Will Edmondson play center field. I think Ty Wilmsmeyer brings a lot as a defender, and he's had some decent at-bats here lately, and he's a good athlete. I'm not saying he should be, you know, Will Edmondson should be your everyday center fielder. But I think if you do want to keep giving those at-bats to a Ross Lovage or to a Jason Jones or to a Peyton Holt or whoever, uh, I think playing Will Edmondson in center field is kind of your way out to do that. I feel like he's done enough, man. I mean, he's hitting 300, 302 for the year. Uh, in SEC play, Will Edmondson is hitting a crisp – 300. He's six for 20. I just feel like he's been super consistent. Uh, made a nice little defensive play the other day. Ty Wilmsmeyer, I should have, I don't remember what game that was. Maybe game two. Made one of the best defensive plays of the year. Really, all three outfielders had a huge defensive play in that game because Kendall Diggs made a diving play on at right field. Uh, but Ty Wilmsmeyer just catches the ball in right center field, guns down a runner trying to get from second to third. That was a huge momentum uh, shift in that game. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying you should take Ty Wilmsmore out of the lineup every day, but if you want to get offensive for a game, I think Will Edmondson can, you know, get some spot starts there. But I think for now, if we're giving an update on the position battles, I think Jared Spraglot made a nice little case this weekend that he gets to stay at third. Fine. We'll reluctantly give that. Uh, <laughs> and I think Will Edmondson is kind of at this point emerged like he's the left fielder. I know Ross Lovich has a ton of experience. I know Jason Jones has a ton of potential, but we haven't seen him in a while. Uh, who who really knows what's going on there? But it seems like Will Edmondson, at least in my eyes, should be your left fielder every day. Um, but we'll see how it plays out. I uh, also want to mention Ryder Helfrich, of course, friend of the program, just came on the show, so maybe, maybe I'm just biased here a little bit. But uh, he's really looked good in his last few starts. He's now hitting – I mean, he's th- – He's three for eight in SEC play, hitting 375. So, I mean, clearly he should be playing every day. But I thought he's looked a lot better these last few weeks, ever since he went blonde. And I feel like that Auburn home run may have like kind of gotten the lid off the basket for him. He looks a lot better lately. We'll see how they you know go about that situation. Hudson White has been swinging the bat a lot better lately. Uh, but he hasn't really brought a ton of gap-to-gap power that I thought he might. Still has just the one home run on the year. Hasn't driven in a ton of runs. 
Uh, I'll be interested to see if they start mixing Ryder Helfrich in a little bit more. Not that Hudson White shouldn't be in the lineup. I mean, I think if he's not in the lineup, he should be, you know, DH or first base or whatever they have to do, keep him involved and keep him getting ABs. But Ryder Helfrich, I thought, looked really good in his start this weekend. So we'll see how they continue to integrate him down the stretch. Uh, before we move on and start looking at some other SEC scores, I did just want to kind of just start reading you guys some of these absurd ERAs on Arkansas's team for the most part. Uh, Arkansas has a team ERA of 263. And so obviously Hagan Smith and Will McIntyre are the two most, most pitch, uh, inning, most, I guess, yeah. Brady Tigert has thrown two more outs than Will McIntyre. Tigert has a 270 ERA. Bum. Uh, Hagan Smith with a 176. Will McIntyre now leads the team after getting two outs yesterday. That kind of threw me off because I remember checking this after his outing on Thursday, and he was like right behind Hagen, but he gets two more outs. So now he is your team leader, at least in, in terms of the top four guys. In ERA at 175. Um, ben Bybee, who has thrown just four innings after coming back from injury, but has looked good in his midweek outings. He's gone four scoreless in his time. Hunter Dietz has gotten the two outs. He's got a zero ERA. Christian Fouch has thrown eight and two-thirds innings this year and gave up a home run, a solo home run in his first outing of the year and has not given up a run since. That is a good, good for a nice little 104 ERA. Stone Hewlett has a 142 ERA, like I mentioned, just a one run and six and a third. Dylan Carter is throwing four and a third, only giving up a one run, 208 ERA. Gage Wood, who had a great outing the other day and it felt like a return to form. It's like, oh, he's back. Seems like he's had a disappointing season. He's got a 213 ERA in 12 and two thirds innings with a ridiculous 22 strikeouts. Uh, Colin Fisher, who's pitched a ton for Arkansas, 20 innings on the year, midweeks, weekends, starting, relieving, closing, all that. Uh, he's got a 225 ERA. Jake Faraday's got a 225 ERA with four innings. Cody Frank's thrown 19 innings. He's got a 284 ERA. Uh, Gabe Gackle has a higher ERA than you think, at 366. But of course, he's got 28 strikeouts in 19 and two thirds. That's a lot of names I just listed you. A lot of really gaudy ERAs. And like some of those dudes don't even pitch. Some of those dudes I just listed, not like Hunter Deeds wasn't even on the roster this past weekend. Ben Bybee wasn't on the roster last weekend. Some of these dudes don't get to pitch on the weekends, and I'm just reading you all these ERAs. It's just stupid what this Arkansas team and this bullpen has, especially in the pitching staff. And I got to be honest with you, but this lineup, I feel like they've settled into a nice little rhythm. Again, they're hitting 283 for the year. Not like top three in the SEC and all these crazy stats. They're not like mashing. Uh, but, I mean, you just look down at the lines. I mean, Nolan Souza's leading you there at 357. Peyton Stovall, 338. Will Edmondson, 302. Ben McLaughlin, 300. Spraglot, 296. Vahiva's all the way up to 295. Kendall Diggs at 286. Lovich, 273. Like, there's just a lot of guys, and Hudson White is creeping up there at 256. He's kind of hovering around there. Uh, so it's like just a lot of guys who are kind of just good hitters, you know, just really solid. Any guy, anybody that's above three, you've got like two or three guys really above 300, a few guys a little bit below 300, but it's like for the most part, it's just a pretty solid one through nine lineup that you feel good about all the options. And uh, there's kind of a different hero every day. And uh, now you've got some pop from these Island boys really starting to come through. It's just nice to look at all these pieces and see what Arkansas has and, I mean, just like, look, again, I, I feel like I've asked you all this question a few times now, but it's like, is there a concern for you about this team? What is it? Is it the fielding? Probably not. It damn sure ain't the pitching, starting pitching, relief pitching, closing. They've got options in every way there. Maybe is it just you want a little bit more pop in the lineup? If so, this weekend should be very encouraging, which is the, with the way Vahiva's swinging the bat. Uh, seemed like Kendall Diggs, I should mention, had three hits in game three, finally seemed to be breaking out of his slump. Uh, ben McLaughlin draws more walks than anyone in the world. Uh, he's just as consistent, as solid as a rock. Uh, like, is it just you want more power? Is it maybe maybe some more speed? Like, maybe more like something? Like, I don't know. I just want to know what is it about this team that gives you guys concern? Because I'm not trying to be dramatic here. Like, obviously, Arkansas is ranked number one, so I'm not breaking news here, but forget the record. I didn't, I'm not even mentioning the record or the games that they've won, but since I might as well, they are 27 and three and 11 and one in SEC play at this point. Uh, but really, I just mean piece by piece. If you just look at this team, it's hard not to feel good. Just everywhere you look, there's just good, solid players at every, every, every position. 
every situation in the bullpen. Uh, it's just a really well-rounded team that seems to be putting it together and coming into its own. It doesn't even feel like they've hit their stride yet. You know, they haven't had a weekend where it's like, oh, they just played out of their minds yet. They're just playing good, solid, sound baseball and sweeping teams like it's nothing, like it's just another day at the office for them. Um, I actually, I want to I want to bring up a quick little funny. I don't have it in front of me. Uh, my buddy Aiden, Big Pig Aid Sap, shout out to him. Uh, love him, but he tweeted, he was like, it's, it's starting to concern him how obvious it is that this is a team of destiny. And, uh, you know, I've kind of hinted at some stuff like that. I don't want to go, you know, too far here, but it's, it is like, it's almost eerie how well-rounded this team is and how good this team is and how, like, there's really nothing, at least on paper, that you would point to and be like, oh, this will be what it is that prevents this team from winning a national title. Like, on paper, it just really doesn't exist unless you just want the lineup to be a little bit more dominant. You want to see some of those gaudy numbers, uh, which, to be honest, you're seeing from some of these guys like Nolan Souza and like Vahiva Aloy in SEC play. So we'll just see how it rolls out. But uh, overall, guys, I'm not saying this is the team, but on paper, this is like this is the best Arkansas team you've probably ever seen. And uh, we'll see how it shakes out. Um, there's a lot of season left, a lot more to prove, a lot of big, big games to play. A lot more to sort out, and obviously they got to prove it in the postseason. But uh, I think we're at that point now where we can start really comparing this team, and from just a talent standpoint, from a well-rounded pieces standpoint, it's hard to find a team better than what Arkansas is putting out there right now. And it feels like they haven't even peaked yet, like I said. So uh, speaking of some of those other teams that they're going to have to play, before we get out of here, let's just take a quick look through the SEC at what happened this weekend. It was a lot of baseball. A lot of high-level matchups, a lot of ones that maybe caught you guys' attention. Uh, so, of course, Arkansas sweeps Ole Miss. Easy. We knew that was going to happen. Cool. So, LSU hosted number 7 Vanderbilt, and the Tigers really went into this weekend 2-7, and seven, really needed to get something going. They win game one behind Luke Holman. They win 10-6. to six, Tried to blow it late in that one. Uh, end up holding on for the game one win, but then LSU drops the next two and gets run-rolled in game three. So LSU is now 3-9 and nine in SEC play and about to have a matchup with Tennessee. Really, the backs are against the wall for LSU. We'll see how they respond. And Vanderbilt gets another nice little series win. Seems like they're starting to put things together and play some really good baseball. Arkansas don't have to play them in the, them in the regular season. But uh, maybe, you know, maybe keep your eye out on the Commodores. Might see them down the stretch at some point. Kentucky... Uh, you know, who is now going to have to replace their head basketball coach uh, for the men's side. Good news for Kentucky fans is Big Blue Nation, you've got a damn good baseball team. Again, I've, I feel like we've talked about it a ton on all these ups, SEC updates. We're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop for Kentucky. I'm not saying it won't ever drop, but they put a whooping on Alabama this weekend, man. They, they, they swept them, and really none of the games were super close. The game one six to 2 was the closest it got on paper. Uh, they really put it on them there in game three. Kentucky's pitching staff in SEC play has been very, very good. Like the numbers are crazy. Uh, I mentioned how last week they were like in their opposing batting average was actually better than Arkansas is going into the weekend. Uh, we'll have to wait until, I guess, we will, y'all won't have to wait as you're listening to this, but I'm saying this on Sunday night. I'll check it first thing Monday morning to see like kind of the rankings and of all the SEC, the updated SEC stats, but I don't have access to that now because I am not in the future. Uh, but yeah, Kentucky's just been doing some unreal stuff in SEC play. They're now 11 and one. So them and Arkansas are just on top of everything. Like we all expected, uh, just as we all predicted. So how about that? They sweep Bama who now Arkansas is about to play in Tuscaloosa. So once again, Arkansas is facing a team coming off of a sweep. We'll see how it goes, but, uh, yeah, big, uh, big development is Kentucky just keeps on freaking winning again. I don't know what they are going to be ranked this morning. I would assume top 10. They've got to be top 10 at least, and probably maybe even closer to top five, especially with some of these results that I'm about to get to here in a little bit. Uh, top five team that had a good weekend was A&M, who did not finish off the sweep against South Carolina. Let me double check to make sure. Uh, yeah, they lost game three, six to five, but uh, the Aggies go to South Carolina and avoid slipping up in a situation that I said last week is like, you know, one you could easily slip up in. Arkansas is going to have to go to Columbia later this year. It's not going to be a super easy series there in South Carolina. Uh, Mark Kingston, South Carolina's head coach, it seems like 
he's starting to lose favor there. Uh, he's had a nice little run. I believe they, I don't know if they've gone to Omaha under him, but they've had a nice little run. Almost, you know, beat Arkansas on that Swiss, that super uh, regional in 2018. They've had some good teams, but it seems like people are kind of over him in South Carolina. Uh, so they lose a series to A&M, which like there's no shame in doing that. But uh, now that makes South Carolina 6-6 six and six in SEC play. We'll see if they're able to stay above 500 and end up making the tournament. If not, I feel like that dude's probably getting canned. Uh, but moving on a little bit, Mississippi State, it seems like every series Mississippi State's in is like the closest, most competitive series of the weekend. They end up winning the series against Georgia via winning a rubber match 9-8 to eight on Sunday. Uh, again, like I mentioned that they blew a couple of leads against Florida late uh, last week, but Mississippi State, it just seems like they're in dog fights, no pun intended, every weekend really close, but that's a really good team. I feel like they have a lot of nice pieces. Uh, we'll see where they're ranked, but they're now 6-6 six and six in SEC play after a nice series win over the Georgia Bulldogs, who had been kind of high variance. Like nobody really knows what to make of Georgia so far. Um Tennessee once again drops game one of a series. They lose game one at Auburn, who uh, Auburn got, you know, went into the weekend one and eight in SEC play. You know, I, I thought they were a better than their record showed type of team, but it seems like the season's kind of getting away from them and their schedule is just brutal. I mean, they played Vanderbilt to start SEC play, they played Arkansas, they played AM. And they played Tennessee. Those are literally the top four teams in the SEC besides Kentucky at this point. Uh, so Auburn wins game one, and you're like, oh, maybe they'll get something together. And then Tennessee wins the next two and wins them convincingly. They win 12-2 to two on Saturday. Uh, or I guess, no, I guess Saturday was game three. Uh, but I feel like game two was also kind of crazy. Yeah, I can't remember what it was. But game two, they won like 15-3. to three, Or game three was like 15-2 to two or something like that. Tennessee does that. They just play in these lopsided games every weekend. But uh, I'm burying the lead here big time. Before we get out of here, I got to mention Missouri swept Florida, number six Florida. We joked about would Missouri, would their, would their over-under for total wins, would it be four and a half? Well, they are now four and eight in SEC play after sweeping the number six Florida Gators. Pretty wild stuff, man. The game one was like back and forth one to one. I think it finished two to one in like 10 innings or something like that. Uh, every game was close. Missouri, they won four to three in game two. They tried to blow a lead in game two. And when I say tried to, they gave up the lead and ended up having to score three runs in the bottom of the ninth, uh, completely chaotic game, but they scored seven runs in the first two innings on Jack Caglione. It was crazy, man. Uh, just kind of shows you, it's just one of those hashtag this league moments where you realize, you know, it's really hard to win in the sec in baseball and look good doing it. Uh, what Arkansas is doing, just a reminder, is just not normal. And, uh, you know, we won't see stuff like that often, and that's why, because it's just really tough to go Columbia, South Carolina, Columbia, Missouri, like Lexington. That's a tough place to go right about now. And that doesn't even mention all your blue bloods like your LSU and your Mississippi State and Ole Miss and all that, where it's like every week in this, in this league is a grind. And uh, that's what makes it fun, and that's what makes what Arkansas – and Kentucky right now, what they're doing so special. And so uh, we'll see if Arkansas is able to keep it going. Uh, again, we will be back. I guess today is Monday. Arkansas doesn't play till Friday. I'm going to go ahead and say we're going to have two shows before Friday. I don't know if it'll end up being like a series preview and a player interview. Maybe I'll just do two shows for the hell of it. Maybe I'll do one live just so we can get some Q&A, get, you know, get some interaction with some of you guys. Uh, who knows? But before I get out of here, I do want to remind you because I'm obligated. Not really, but just because, you know, just want to remind you guys. Subscribe on the YouTube if you have not already. The Bombastic Podcast. Make sure your buddy, if you if you and your buddy talk about this podcast and y'all like listening, make sure he's subscribed to and make sure your aunt, your uncle, all these people, anybody who likes the show and likes Arkansas baseball, uh, make sure they are subscribed to the YouTube channel because I know some people like the show but don't know how to find it. YouTube, The Bombastic Podcast, which is separate from our main Natty State feed. Uh, be sure also to subscribe to your Apple and your Spotify and your whatever. If you like listening to podcasts in the car like I do or as you're going to sleep, uh, you can do subscribe to that there. And uh, be sure to keep your eyes peeled for Natty State Sports, our main YouTube channel. This week, I would imagine, is going to be a crazy one. Coach Calipari, the baseball team still cooking. Uh, football spring practice. Got the spring game coming up on Saturday. 
just a hectic time to be an Arkansas Razorback fan. Don't miss it. We're going to have it all covered for you at NattyStateSports.com. And, uh, you know, of course, our website, NattyStateSports.com. Check out that we got plenty of written content coming, baseball, basketball, football, you name it. We're covering it uh, and better than everyone else. So, uh, guys, appreciate you bearing with me for this. It's now like it is now 1.34 a.m. Uh, I need to get home. <laughs> uh, I need to get to sleep. But I appreciate you guys listening and tuning in. It's been a lot of fun, man, and we are going to keep it rolling. There's still a lot of season left. Strap in. Uh, I could not be more excited. I also, before, last thing I'm going to say, I swear I'm getting out after this. I just want you guys to know how much joy this Arkansas baseball team really does bring me. And not just the team, like, when I drive to bomb and I get into my parking spot and I'm just walking to the yard, now that the weather's good especially, it's just, like, so comforting every weekend to know that we get to do the same thing and watch Arkansas play SEC baseball and, you know, I, this this season has already felt pretty special. Just kind of doing the, the first year of this podcast, I've been I've really enjoyed watching it, you know, and observing it with some of y'all and being able to talk about it on this platform. Uh, and I'm just I'm really pumped about the future of this podcast, future of the program, and future of you know this season that we're watching unfold. Uh, you know, I just this is my favorite thing to talk about. I I got a little like weird emotional on, on Twitter and was talking about how how much I love this podcast and just getting to do this. And uh, I hope you guys, I hope this helps your viewing experience, even 1%. Really appreciate you guys tuning in. I've been really pleased with kind of the progress of the subscribers starting to build up on YouTube and people kind of getting into it and commenting. And I do also want to give a shout out to the Dixon Street Discord. Uh, been a really awesome Discord page. I'm, I was not super familiar with it, but uh, my buddy Scantron, I'm just going to say Scantron because I don't want to say his government name out here. Uh, he put me on, and he's built a nice little community over there. It's pretty much a message board, but without all the weird stuff of a message board. If you are interested and would like to get linked up there, I will ma- I will see if I can get a link in the description. But uh, if not, retweet it, tweet and reach out to me because it is a nice little community of Hog fans. But uh, I'm going to be also – me and Curtis have been mixing it up on there. I believe Scotty's about to get on, sit on there soon. Uh, we've been mixing it up there on the Dixon Street Discord. Uh, stay tuned because we will be, you know – dropping some stuff over there and uh, I've been enjoying mixing up with that community. And uh, again, guys, I'm getting out of here now for real. It's, it's like 140. I'm on running on fumes. Uh, you know, again, subscribe everywhere. I told you to subscribe, have a great weekend. We will be back with you at least one more time before Arkansas plays Alabama this weekend and probably twice. Cause that's just how we roll. It's been another great adi- edition of the bombastic podcast. I will see you guys soon.